So my name is Tony Wu, and what I'm going to do tonight for the next 45 minutes to an hour is share some stories with you. Um, I'm going to start by showing you some images of uh, just a few whales, a few different types of whales. Basically, I was struggling with what to do to uh, with this visit because I only have about an hour and I have so much to say that I, I started putting slides together and before I knew it I had slides to talk for like 12 hours and I realized that's not going to work. Um, and so to satisfy my need to sort of show you a lot of stuff, I'm going to flip through, I think it's four slides very quickly with a lot of different types of whales. And then for the balance of the time, I'm going to talk about sperm whales. And what I really want to do, because we're in Nantucket, um, I want to tell you a lot about sperm whales, but not in the academic way. Um, I will try to convey some information, you know, facts and figures and things like that. But I want to impart to you stories, um, personal experiences. I want you to use your imagination, and if I describe the situations well enough, to be there with me to understand what it's like to be in the ocean with these incredible animals, the skeleton of which is here. By the way, how cool is it? <laughs> That's right there. <laughs> Um, so, um, and then at, at the end, I'm going to try to wrap everything up, tie it back into Nantucket, and leave you with some, uh, a few things to think about. So, to get started, um, this is what I do for a living. It's a job. Um, this is my office, uh, humpback whales. Um, humpback whale up there, humpback whales doing crazy things. That's a blue whale, and that's a sperm whale. Um, all these are whales, they have many different uh, characteristics. Thanks. Um, and that was my first trip to Alaska last year. We had great conditions. Luck plays an important part. They're basically feeding. Some of you or all of you may know about the bubble net feeding where they cooperate to gather uh, mainly herring but other fish too. That's a teeny tiny baby. Well, teeny tiny for a gray whale is about five and a half meters long. Um, which is about 18 feet or so, and uh, coming up to my camera to give it a kiss. That's a female with a baby uh, humpback, and that is a dwarf minke whale. Dwarf or minke whale means the species gets to about 8 meters in length or so, 27, th say 30 feet. Um, here is a baby humpback whale coming in to take a look. That's a whole bunch of uh, basically boy humpbacks chasing a female humpback, and probably the, ob the point is obvious there. And <laughs> here is um, a humpback that's spy hopping and a friend of mine there kindly posing for the photo. Um, this is up in Alaska again. That's how close you can get sometimes under the right circumstances. That's a minke whale coming in for a close look. This is a species of whale called the Brutus whale, which is sort of like a, you know, everybody knows what a blue is, and there's uh, fin whales, say whales, Brutus whales, minke whales, sort of in that order of the size. Um, and there's actually quite a few different species and subspecies of each. Um, so um, we don't, we collectively, humanity, don't actually know how many different subspecies there are. And this is um, just to show you how uh, playful whales can be. Um, that's a, a baby just having a good time. So um, I'm going to get to the sperm whales, which is the whole point of this uh, presentation. I'm going to start with a story about the first time that I encountered a sperm whale. This was back in the year 2000, and I started planning this in 1997 when I met a, a, uh, a couple in Japan, in the islands, the Bonin Islands in English, Ogasawara in Japanese. They are about, if you drew a line from Tokyo to connecting to Guam, and about halfway in between, a thousand kilometers southeast, is a small group of islands, it's an archipelago, actually a few small archipelagos that are tied together. Um, and they used to be a whaling station. They were important during World War II, and they were actually kept by the US until, I think, the late 60s. Um, anyways, there's not a lot of people out there. It's next to a trench, and my friends, uh, were uh, two of the people who helped figure out the patterns for the whales that, that uh, visit that area, humpbacks first, and then sperm whales. So when I met them in 1997, they were just starting to get, understand the sperm whale patterns, and I just met them, and they told me that sperm whales go to that area. So this is the first sperm whale I, I met. 
1997, when they told me these things, um, we were drinking, we were sharing a few drinks, and the more I drank, the more I thought, I really need to get into the water with a sperm whale. Um, so as the evening wore on, you know, it became, I really need to, no, I really need to get into the water. And I was very insistent, and nobody had done this. Um, so they told me, you know, you really need to get permission, and we need to set aside time, and it's far away, and telling me all the things, all the reasons why we couldn't do it. So I kept pouring drinks for the captain, and by the end of the evening, we had a plan. <laughs> it took three years to get out there, and I allotted 14 days. Uh, the first 12 days, we got hit by four typhoons in a row, one of which came, on the came to the islands, passed us, turned back around, and sat on the islands again. So by the 13th day, it was pretty anxious to get out there. And the waters were still sloppy. There was still quite a bit of wind. Seas, you know, three, four meter swells in the sea seas. But we went out. We went out, and in and about uh, three or four hours of looking, we saw nothing, absolutely nothing. It's pretty discouraging. But, you know, we had sunshine, and uh, we still had about half a day left. So we decided to break for lunch. We break out our lunch boxes, bento boxes in Japanese. I go up to the top deck um, to kind of have a seat and, lo and look around. And as soon as I get, I get up, I climb up the ladder, I get up, I turn around to sit down, and I look down, and I'm looking toward the stern of the boat, and from the stern of our boat, there's a fluke sticking out. That was not part of the boat. So I'm looking at down and sort of thinking, well, we've been looking for a whale for three or four hours. So I kind of nudged the captain and said, well, do you see this? And he looks down and he drops his lunch you know, on the floor. So I figured, OK, it really is a whale. <laughs> um, so we climbed down, and we had a plan agreed. Um, I would get into the water. My wife and his wife would get in as spotters. Um, more because the conditions were rough and, you know, just in case somebody had a problem with their snorkel or, or whatever. So we get into the water, um, you know, picture beautiful tropical blue water, as you can see, and we're getting tossed around, um, good light, but a little bit cold, um, and the whale is probably where the wall is over there. I can make it out over there, but I'm getting tossed up and down, up and down, so it's not too easy to see. I signal to the others that I'm going to dive down. So I take a few breaths, and I dive. And when I dive, you know, I'm like this, so my back is to the whale. And I'm taking my time going down. I get down to about 30 feet or so. And I come up, which means I turn back to face the direction where the whale is. And the whale, I knew the direction, but the whale was right here. <laughs> so I didn't expect that, and I saw this big, you know, <laughs> massive blob in front of me. It took a a second or so to register, and when it registered, my mind just went, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so I let out a, all the air that I had, which is not a good thing to do when you're 30 feet down, and I realized that I needed to go up. So I went as fast as I could up to the surface, and as I went up, this whale followed. Now, I need to back up for one second, because um, that that uh, set of islands where I was um, had been a whaling area, and it wasn't that long ago when it was a whaling area, and there were still people who had either participated or perhaps had family members who participated. So there were stories about sperm whales, and all of those stories said, well, conveyed that they were aggressive or you know hard to deal with, and they had big mouths and big teeth, which they do, you can see. Um, and, you know, it was all this scary stuff, and that was what was in my head. Plus, of course, the stories from other whaling days, including here. Um, then the captain told me, before I went into the water, listen, if the whale turns on its sonar, it might think you're food. So that would be really bad. So as I'm shooting up to the surface, what do you think happens? The sonar comes on, but it doesn't just come on like a little bit. It comes on full force, like sonic boom, and it's like standing next to um, the speakers at 
a Van Halen concert and having Eddie Van Halen hit that first chord when you're right next to the concert and you go flying. That's how loud it was and it was painful, um, but I was already in panic, so you know, a little bit of pain, it didn't matter. And I brushed to the surface and was trying to get, catch my breath and I know at this point that rational thought was not with me, it was somewhere else. Because I, I, can, I have bits and pieces in my mind of what happened and I do recall the whale popping up like a submarine right in front of me. And I recall having the thought, I don't want to touch this whale. So I had camera in one hand, my free hand here, long fins uh, on my two feet, and you know, being thrown around in the waves. And I'm trying to back pedal like this, which is not the best way to swim in the water. And the whale decided, the sonar's still on, the whale decided that it was going to investigate me, so it comes at me pretty quickly. So I can't back up quickly enough, and this whale comes right at me, and within fractions of a second, I am planted on top of its head, approximately there. So um, the reason I, I know that I was not thinking rationally is because the thought that I recall from that experience was, I have to push the whale away. Yeah, you see, it doesn't make sense. Um, so I did, you know, put my hands down on it and tried to push it away. And of course, I did succeed in separating from the whale. And I backpedaled again, and the whale came again, and I found myself in the same position again. So we did this over and over and over, four, five, six times. I'm not exactly sure how many, until the point where I reached, pretty much reached exhaustion. So I'm, I'm, I'm planted here on its head, and it's raising its head up, and I'm sort of sliding down here, and I've just kind of given up. And I, I have no energy left. I've swallowed a, a ton of seawater, and I'm planted on top of this sperm whale's head. And in case you, I forgot to mention this the other night, but in case you were wondering what it's like, or what it feels like, it's sort of, if you can imagine a um, tractor trailer tire, and you spray water on it and wet it down, and you hug it, that's kind of what it feels like. It's, you can, you can kind of squeeze it, but it's hard and tough, but it's not hard, hard. Um, so I'm on, its, I'm on its head, and you know things po couldn't possibly get worse when I feel a tug on my left leg. I think, oh, you know, tug. And they go, oh, no, this can't be happening. And you know, when you're a little kid and you're lying on your bed and you think there's a big monster under your bed, you know you have to look, but you don't really want to look. <laughs> well, that was pretty much it. I didn't really want to look, but I kind of just kind of peeked down and sure enough, it had my fin and up to just about where my foot is in its mouth and it was kind of gnawing on it and tugging every once in a while, which then amazingly gave me a lot of energy. <laughs> so I... I turned around, I pushed off, I turned around, and I swam away, which was probably the first smart thing I did, because as soon as I turned around and looked the other way, I wasn't looking at the whale, and that sort of allowed me to start thinking. And as I was swimming away, I recall the thought finally coming into my head that, well, if this thing wanted to eat me, I had plenty of chance to do that, so maybe it doesn't want to eat me. And then the other side of my head said, well, it does want to eat you. And I thought, no, maybe it doesn't. So I was having this little discussion with myself as I was going along. And I turned back to look, and it was following me. So I figured, OK, either it's going to eat me, and I'm toast. Or it's not going to eat me, and I'm going to get some pretty awesome photos. <laughs> so I turned around, and I swam back toward it. So say the whale is here, and I'm swimming back toward it. And as, as I slow down and pass it, I'm looking it in the eye, and I'm making eye contact. And we look each other in the eye, and I slow down and stop. And here's this whale looking at me, and I look straight in, and all I see is curiosity. There's no malice, no threat, no nothing, just basically looking at me saying, what are you? So you know, I continued. I passed, and I thought, hmm. Not quite sure what to make of this. And then I thought, well, okay, 
I started looking at my camera, setting, you know, looking at the light, setting the aperture and the shutter. This was back in the days of film, so I couldn't take test shots or anything. And uh, I decided, okay, I'm going to make this whale follow me so that I can get myself between the whale and the sun, which I did, you know, and it was following me. And then I turned around, took a couple quick shots, um, and I was still not quite all together there, but nervous. And, and I took the shots, turned around, started swimming away again, looked back, realized it's not gonna, it, it's not gonna eat me. And then I turned back around and swam toward it, and then uh, it stopped. And we had a few moments there, and I took some photos, and I swam by it again, looked in its eye again, and I realized I have a friend. So we spent three hours together in total, and basically it was, you know, me swimming one way, it would swim with me, I'd swim another way, it'd swim with me. I'd steer it into the right light, into the right place, wait for the waves to get in the right conditions, and take photos. And then I ran, I ran out of film, because we only had 36, 37 shots at the time. I finally got the boat, which was, you know, when the whale charged over towards me, the two safety spotters, <laughs> they were back on the boat. <laughs> so I went back to the boat, and I handed up the camera, and got back on the swim step, and I had several cameras prepared already with film in them, and I asked for another camera. And I said, you're going back in the water? And I was so, f I remember this very clearly, I was so furious, I didn't want to say anything to him, I didn't want to talk to him. I was like, give me the camera. I took the camera, and while I was sitting on the swim step, I'm on the stern, you know, and I pulled my legs up, I'm on the swim step, holding on, and down in the water, the whale, if this is the stern, the whale has pulled up to the boat, has, is on its side, eye looking up, and just following the boat as we're going along. And as soon as I get in, the whale pulls back, gives me some space, we get in, and we go play again. So after three hours and after many rolls of film, I'm tired, it's getting late, it's 4.35 in the afternoon, we have an hour and a half or so to get back to land, so we gotta call it a day. I decided I just wanna take a few photos from the top deck where I can look down on the boat, get my long lens out, climb up to the top deck, and the whale is at the stern of the boat, just waiting, looking up. So I find myself in the unusual situation of having a one-way conversation with the whale. I'm saying, I'm not going in. And the whale is just sitting there. And I'm not going to go in. I can't go in. I'm too tired. It's too late. I can't go in. Just move out from the boat, please. And after a while, it took five, ten minutes, and the whale finally got tired. He swam around to the bow area, just in front of the bow, made, uh, brought its fluke up, like it was going to dive. And then it, instead of diving, it splashed the boat and completely doused it six times. <laughs> then he swam back to the stern and sat there, took up position at the stern, <laughs> said, come on. <laughs> so again, I sat there talking with the whale in English so everybody else was, didn't understand. And um, <laughs> then it came back up to the front of the boat and it did it again three or, more, three or four more times, completely doused us, went back to the stern, finally realized I'm not going to uh, go back in the water, came back to the front of the boat and brought its fluke up and did actually dive and disappeared. And so that was the first time, and that's what got me started, and that's my first whale. <laughs> so, um, and of course, the first time I really had thought about in any detail sperm whales was in high school when I was, um, I read Moby Dick, or actually um, was forced to read Moby Dick. <laughs> and um, actually the version that I read was more something like this. <laughs> but, 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 but I finished Moby Dick uh, a month ago. So it took 29 years, but I did it. And I'm actually glad that I did did that um, because I actually understood a lot of what was in there now and I'm really surprised by how much the people uh, who were whaling in the early 1800s actually knew about the whales. They actually knew a lot um, and I, I understood the references to the whales, to the whaling, and I wish I would not have had I read this in high school. Um, so let me tell you about sperm whales. Um, this is a typical sperm whale, and as you can see, the um, main features are 
this big head, a big mouth, a teeny tiny eye, and a teeny tiny pectoral fin. Big contrast to some of the other whales you might have in your head, especially humpbacks, which are very popular. And when most people think of whales, probably think of humpbacks. Now this whale doesn't actually, I mean, at least to me, it doesn't look like it's made for swimming. It's big and blocky in the front. I mean, you think about uh, hydrodynamics, you'd want a nice pointed nose like a blue whale, and you could slice through the water very quickly with fins for stabilizers. I mean, this thing is the exact opposite. So you gotta wonder why it's like this. Um, now, as I mentioned with uh, Moby Dick, there were many things that people in the early 1800s actually did know. You know, they knew that whales breathe air, they take care of their babies, they raise them on milk, um, they're warm-blooded, and yet they came to the conclusion that they're spouting fish with a horizontal tail. At least they got the horizontal tail right. Um, I'm not sure why they said that. It's actually kind of a surprise. And I, I tend to think that they actually knew that they were mammals, but because it, it, the industry was called a fishery, and it's sort of a little bit easier to justify, you know, going after fish than it is a mammal. I don't know, maybe I'm interpreting a little too much, but I feel like that might have been the case. Um, so let's get back to the, the reason why these whales are the way they are. With a close-up view, you can see, I mean, you can compare this with that. This is so handy to have. Um, but it's basically, you know, you're looking at that from the, the front angle. This is the mouth, which ends up occupying about uh, a third, a quarter of its body. They only have teeth in the lower jaws. And you've got this big thing here. Now, if you had to boil down the essence of a sperm whale, it's this. The spermaceti is located up here. That was the high value oil, which you can see some of the, um, a couple, a few bottles, four bottles of it here around the corner. And then there was some more here. But what's really interesting is what this is probably used for. I say probably because we don't really know. But from experience in the water with these animals, I know that sonar is a very, very important part of their lives. And I will show you examples of, uh, in video and in, with sound a little bit later. But here you see diagrammatically what's going on here. There's a spermaceti organ. They do have two air passages just like we do, but only one, the left side is exposed to the air. On the right side is this little organ here called the monkey lips phonic lips here. And this is probably what produces the clicking and the sonar patterns that you will hear a little bit later. Um, now, my, my belief is that this makes the sound. This is an echo chamber, and the sound comes out this way, is directed this way. And there can be beam forming this way. I'm just going to leave that with you now. Just keep that in mind, and you'll see why a little bit later. And out of interest, here is the front view there. Um, so taking a look at the sperm whale from the surface to look you know, at the left side, that's where the blowhole is. So that diagram earlier, the single blowhole, and this is characteristic of the sperm whale. The other big whales that you might see, um, Brutus whales, humpback whales, they all have two blowholes. So if you're out at sea and you see a single blow and it's so, sort of slanted to one side, and the side may vary depending on which side you're looking at, it's probably a sperm whale. And a close-up view would be this. That's the one hole. And also, um, it's quite different from the other whales that you might come across or might see photos of or drawings of, is the dorsal fin. Um, you know, most whales have the, the sort of triangular, sleek, you know, shark fin-like shape to cut through the water. This is just a big blob on the back. Um, it's definitely not for cutting through the water. So now I'm going to show you a sh very short video clip. I'm going to show it to you twice. First time, just look at it, enjoy it. my friend kicking my, my camera. 
Um, now, this time, I want you to pay attention to two things. One, this mark here. Two, watch the way the whale moves its head. Okay, so hold the, the, the little mark in your head for a little while. But did you see the way the whale sort of moved its head like this, like a waving back and forth pattern? And also note that it was flipped upside down but to us, and it was mouth side to us. Now, if you recall the diagram, I was saying that I think that the sonar is beam formed in the direction of the mouth. Now, if you look at that, what that reminds me of is, you know, when people have headphones on and they've got something to receive sound and they're trying to pick up the signal, they keep moving this back and forth to zero in on the signal. Now, these whales are making these sounds for a purpose. It's not just for fun. They are echolocating to try to figure out where things are and what you are. And it makes total sense to me that they're sending that beam, aiming it toward your direction and moving back and forth to get that image. And why would they flip upside down to do that? Most of the time, they're not wasting that sonar on us. They're down deep looking for food. They need to eat all the time, just like we do. So it would make more, most sense if you think about the big head. If it's trying to hunt food that's above it, it's very inefficient. It'd have to flip around every time. It's going to be trying to locate food in the same direction where its jaw is located, its mouth is located, and also where those teeny tiny little eyes might be able to see. Anything that's in front and above, the whale can't see. Below, it might be able to, just because of the way the shape of the head is. So take another look at a whale and you see what I mean. So if it's down hunting, it's gonna be looking here for food. The sonar is going to be primarily directed this way. Now, I have no doubt that it can send it in different directions, but it's going to be this way because if it picks up something and it forms an image in its brain, very large brain, by the way, then it knows that it can use this very large mouth to pick up whatever that food may be. And these eyes, as you can see, are no use at all to be spotting what's here. So remember that little dot? on the bottom of that, that uh, whale in the video. Take a look at this whale. See that? That's exactly the same whale. That's gonna come important later. But one thing I worked out pre actually pretty quickly is that whales, sperm whales, sorry, have fingerprints, so to speak, on their abdomens. See that one? It's got a mark too, it's different, right? So if I were to see this whale again, I could tell it's that whale. If I could see this whale again, I could tell it's that whale again, so long as it turned its abdomen towards me. Now, it just so happens that quite often, when they are in the mood and they're curious and they come toward somebody in the water, they're going to turn this way. And why do they do that? Because that's where their sonar is the most effective. Makes sense. They're looking at you. Sort of like for us with our eyes, if, you're trying to, if I'm trying to look at the skeleton of the whale, I'm not gonna face this way, I'm gonna face that way. If it's using its sonar to form an image, it's going to face the direction where its sonar is effective. And to give you another example, this is a totally different whale in a different ocean with a different pattern, but look, it's flipped over again. You're gonna see this over and over again. It's not because they enjoy flipping over. In the water, there's no up and down for them, except when they need to breathe. They just face the direction that is of most use to them. And you'll see it here, too. Now, here's another one that's totally different pattern, but it's facing me. It's not facing up, because I'm actually down in the water. I'm down whatever depth this was, I can't remember. Um, and it's facing toward me because it had just swum this way and it had used this sonar, aimed it directly at me. Not rocket science, makes sense. Um, now, sperm whales 
you may have heard or you may have noticed in some of these photos are very, very social animals. They have the basic family structure or the basic social structure that we know about. Um, there are families that live in tropical waters, primarily tropical waters or relatively warm waters. And these families comprise females, adult females with a matriarch, um, juveniles and little babies. And the juveniles and babies can be of either sex. At some point, the males grow up, and the estimates range from 10 to 20 years or so. Um, they are either forced out or they leave of their own accord. They start to move to the colder climates, so north in the northern hemisphere, south in the southern hemisphere. They form uh, little gangs of guys and go do guy stuff for a little while, um, get bigger. And then when they get really big, they move even farther north or farther south into really cold water and go after really big prey to get really nice, big, and fat. And then at some point, when they're big and fat, like sumo wrestlers, they come back into the temperate and tropical areas to look for these female family groups. So what you see here, this is a f an adult female, and that's a baby. It's flipped upside down, and I think it's just flipping upside down just for fun. Um, and that is about a typical average female adult is about 12 meters, which is uh, 39, 40 feet or so, thereabouts. And the babies are born at something to four to five meters, maybe 15 feet-ish, something like that. Now, very interesting is the family structure, it's similar to elephants on land. So with the whales, just because you see this female with this baby does not necessarily mean that this female is the biological mother of that baby because they practice communal care. Um, and you can't necessarily know that if you see two of them together, they're biological, you know, biologically related. They may be. You know, without DNA, you can't be 100% sure. Now, they do this because, well, the babies can't, their food is down deep. Babies can't go down deep. Somebody's gotta take care of the baby. This makes sense, right? Otherwise, the mom would just sit there for the entire duration of the time the baby was growing up and not eat. Doesn't make sense. So, um, mo one way to think about sperm whales, okay? We live, at the, we live in air. Most of the animals we see, even the ocean animals, come up and breathe air, and they're usually near the surface and spend a lot of time at the surface. So, think of sperm whales not as surface beings. They spend 90 or more percent of their lives below 800 meters. They are beings from the deep that occasionally come up to say hi, take a breath and go back down. So when the babies are born, because they're mammals, they can't live in that world. They have to hang out and the adults have to take care of them. Now, I've actually seen this firsthand. Um, you, know, you have a, an adult female with a little baby swimming along the surface and they're just swimming and I swim and we keep up know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, just swimming, swimming, swimming. And all of a sudden, the baby will just squeak, 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 and charge down into the ocean. And you look down, look down, and out of the haze, you see an adult whale appearing out of the deep. The baby goes to greet the adult. There's a lot of chatter and a lot of happy baby things happening there, and you can see it happening, and you can hear it going on. And then they come up, and they rendezvous with the other adult. They swim together for a while. The adults have a discussion. You can hear all the chatter and the clicking, the babies doing flips and twirls and things like that. And then the adult that was at the surface takes off and goes down. The adult that came up stays with the baby. I've seen this many times. Um, they, it, it varies. They go down for 30 minutes to an hour or so generally, but it, it varies because it varies on the terrain, the depth, the, the um, level of activity, the amount of prey, you know, but you can count on 30 minutes at least. Um, and in case you're wondering, this is what a typical family would look like. This is not everybody in the family, but it's almost everybody. And by the way, uh, sperm whales, one other thing I've noticed is that they fart a lot. <laughs> now I said that to complete seriousness because that, it's actually a very important point. Um, I mentioned that they're social, 
they, they are, you know, they hang out together. These two in this family were roughly the same age. I would say something human equivalent, say 10, 12 years old or something like that. And they, you know, love to play, very inquisitive, mischievous. You know, the, uh, the adults would be hanging out and resting and these two would come and play and have a good time. Um, and you can see, look at the expression on this whale's face. I mean, it's obvious, it is curious, it is interested, it's coming in to check me out. Um, and this is very common. I have this type of experience uh, quite a bit. So when you think of, uh, say, humpback whales, maybe you've seen photos of them breaching, jumping out of the water, and they're very elegant, and they have got, got those beautiful pectoral fins and you know, the big sweeps and all the spray coming off. Um, sperm whales breach too. Unfortunately, they are nowhere near as attractive as humpback whales. So they sort of plop. This is a calf, and they sort of plop. It's not very elegant, and they make a big thud. Um, but they do do it. And having seen this happen many times now, I sort of, in hindsight, realized that that first sperm whale, when it came up to me and was using me as a chew toy, was actually being friendly like this. This is in a family group, and they're not trying to hurt each other. They're just socializing. So if you think of how canines on land would socialize, if you have dogs or you play with dogs, you know they gnaw at you, nibble at you, and with each other, and it's not meant to hurt you in any way. This is very similar. They do that with each other um, quite often. In fact, they are very tactile. Um, and you can see the type of interaction here where there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, if you'll note the skin patterns here, they peel off skin a lot and they rub up against each other a lot. And they are totally aware of what the other members of their family are doing. You know, for us, like right now, for us to be in a social situation like this, I can see all of you, you can see me. Sight is probably the most important of our senses in terms of socialization. For them, sight is important, but not necessarily just sight because they use sound and they can probably use the, um, the vibrations in the water, the movement of water to know what's going on and they, can e they often do mimic each other's movements like you see here in this photo. Now to try to give you a sense of what it's like uh, to be in the water when the whales are socializing. Take a look at this. It's usually pandemonium. Um, and now it's not an aggressive bad pandemonium. It's like you stick, you know, 10, five-year-old kids into a pool in summer day and they just go wild. It's sort of that kind of pandemonium. Um, and what happens, remember I pointed to the skin, is a lot of skin dislodges. So you will get a lot of this floating on. This is a pretty big piece, but usually they're small pieces. And, you know, we have hands. We can groom ourselves. Animals, a lot of animals don't, including whales. And this is probably a way to get rid of dead skin, get rid of parasites, you know, help injuries heal, all of that. And I, th I think, this is just my speculation, is that the socialization is uh, just part and parcel for this purpose. So you can see what it's like. Now, if you've ever held like a, one of those glad plastic trash bags that is like the really thin ones that are not such great quality, it's sort of like that. And if you stick it in water, that's exactly what it'd be like, except when you bring it up and it dries, it becomes brittle and cracks and falls apart and smells kind of fishy. Um, the whales, you know, their heads You've seen how important it is for their communication, uh, for their sensing what other things are in the water, but they use it almost for a sense of, I think, for pleasure. And when you see things like this, where they stick their heads together and they're clicking away, they're rubbing together, and they do it for extended periods of time, it's not a one-off little thing, and they move around and change positions, but it's constant sound and constant contact. So they even change formations like this. Um, there's got to be a purpose to that other than 
just making sounds. Sometimes, um, very rarely, but sometimes, the socialization process allows, they allow people to come in too. It's very rare, and in fact, um, I was talking with somebody else who had been to the talk before, and I may have given the wrong impression, but this socialization, I think, is very important to the whales, and it's the only real time that I can spend a long time with them. It's not very frequent. They are hunting food all the time. Um, they, like us, need to have a constant uh, replenishment of calories. So they don't have a lot of time to play, especially the adults. They're always going down. So if you come across these whales, they might spend five to ten minutes on the surface, go back down, spend 30 minutes to an hour down there hunting food, hopefully catching something to eat, come back up, breathe for a little while, go back down. This will go on and on and on and on. So you're not likely to encounter some of those crazy situations. But then they do come together and every once in a while and have these meetings for some reason. Sometimes they let us in, like this one. Um, so that, that's my wife who abandoned me the first time we saw an, a sperm whale. And she's now come to realize, or sorry, I've come to realize that sperm whales are not that bad. So she took advantage of that knowledge and went back in with the sperm whales. And this is a very unusual sperm whale. The family was very, very uh, receptive. They were engaged in socialization. And this sperm whale was very, very familiar with people. In fact, would insist that you pet it. He would come charging at you and would not let you go until you pet it. And when you pet a sperm whale, and this is not, probably not going to happen to you, but if you pet a sperm whale, you have to use your entire body because it's big. And you're just going, you know, like this. So even though we knew that this sperm whale was friendly, you can imagine you've got a 30 tons or thereabouts. This was not fully grown, so maybe 30 tons, um, you know, 35, 40 feet foot animal coming at you, high speed, throwing, kicking up a wake, coming full speed at you. And you know you have to stand your ground because if it comes at you, it will stop right here and then you have to pet it. If you try to run away, it will. Ch this one would chase you down, and that's not pleasant. Um, but he was very friendly, and he would close his eyes and you know appreciate the. So every once in a while, it does happen. Um, that same family group, you know, followed for a long time, and um, when they get to know you, uh, when they get to feel comfortable with you, they do things that, or I think they relax. And they will do things that are more natural, like come into formation like this. You know, I'm, I'm right next to them, basically, and they come up from the deep. And I dive down to meet them. We met at 15 meters or so. And they just sort of held position, let me in right into the middle of them, taking these photos. Air was out, it's coming back up. And they all came up with me. So I broke the surface first. And within seconds, you know, left and right, poof, poof, poof. Pretty awesome feeling. Um, but it's because we'd spent several days together. They knew who I was, they, or they knew that something was constantly harassing them in any case. Um, and they were comfortable with it. The most, probably the most amazing underwater experience I've had in terms of numbers of whales um, was actually just recently in, um, in March this year. There were several groups of whales swimming together, um, groups of 20 or 30 at a time, and I could see them coming up in different places. I estimate that there were 100 whales. I can't be sure, but it was something like that. Um, and this happens every once in a while. These, these aggregations are probably the types of aggregations that uh, you know we've got stories left from the whaling days of so many whales, probably something like this. And I managed to get 23 of them in one frame here. Um, and this was. I, I was facing some of the whales, and they were coming through. But there were whales to my left, to my right, below me, above me. And I couldn't get them all until they passed. And like water going past an obstacle, they then coalesced immediately right behind me. So I turned around and was able to get this. This was in the Indian Ocean. Um, and you know, the social animals, just like us social animals, we have rules. You know, you have to have rules for a good society. And in whale, remember I mentioned that they fart a lot? If they fart, you have to leave the group, basically. <laughs> um, I, I, I kid you not, it happens a lot. 
I don't know why, but it happens a lot. Now, the, <laughs> there's been a lot of um, uh, news recently, uh, past two, three years especially, and you might not have seen any of this if you're not a whale geek, but there's discussion of sperm whales being carbon neutral because they go down deep, they eat things, they come up, they, they poop, and it causes plankton blooms, which then sequesters carbon, which then gets sinks. You know, those scientists, I don't think they understand that whales emit a lot of methane, <laughs> which counteracts all of that. Now, here's the poop, okay? There's a point to this. This is just not gratuitous grossness. Um, I, I, saw, I see this a lot, and um, I started thinking, well, the first time, you know, it was just kind of, uh, second time, uh, third time, I started thinking, maybe it's me. Um, and then I started seeing this happen, you know, so often that I started thinking, wait a minute, there's got to be something to this. And, you know, in order to get this photo, I'm swimming at top speed to try to get it before it kind of disperses. So mo within a second after this, I'm right in the middle of it. Okay? It's not that bad, as long as you don't swallow. So <laughs> going right through it, and you know what? I lost the whale. It's a 12-meter whale, 20, 25 tons. It was right in front of me, and now it's gone. Now, what do whales eat? Primarily cephalopods, primarily squids, some octopuses too. What do they do when they want to defend themselves? They ink. They form a big ink cloud and they disappear, right? So I started thinking, oh, could it be? But nah, that's silly. So I, I tend to, anytime I think of something at all, I tend to put it up on my, on my site and you know, some people write to me and say, that's genius. Some people say you're stupid and, you know, variations thereof. And this, I'm usually not worried about writing stuff because I don't care what people say. But this, I thought was so silly, I've never put up. And then, in preparation for coming here, besides finally finishing Moby Dick, I read a few other books. One was a book called um, The um, Great Sperm Whale by Richard Ellis. And I would normally not put up a whole bunch of words, but I'm going to point your attention to this part that the release of feces occurs in response to threatening situations, and that one possible use of this behavior may be for concealment. So I'm sitting <laughs> in a bed and breakfast um, reading before we go out in the ocean, and I read that line, and I jump up and start screaming and hooting and hollering because this is from a scientific paper. So I email Richard, and he confirms this and tells me there's other people who've said this, so I don't feel so bad about it now, and that's why I'm sharing it with you. <laughs> and that was the constructive purpose for sh showing you all of this. And just to kind of rub it in, so to speak, here's another one. Um, and now, the thing is that I have the entire sequence of these whales passing by, right? And right there, there's 10 or 12 whales. That's how effective it is. It's pretty cool, huh? And... Uh, this is, uh, just because we're on the topic, this is blue whale poo. <laughs> and it's uh, fizzy and sort of melt, fizzes like Alka-Seltzer and disperses very quickly. So you have to get in very quickly um, when this happens. This is a uh, humpback whale. And uh, that's humpback whale. And we'll get on to the other stuff. <laughs> um, so I'm going to show you a video now. So you don't have to use so much imagination. This is what it's like to be in the water with a, a socializing group of sperm whales. So you see the person for scale, you see all the skin coming off, you see them socializing, kind of milling around, rubbing up against each other every once in a while, and the sound, you hear the repeating pattern, 
the click, 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 click. Okay, that is, every family group has what's called a coda. And just like in music, the coda is the repeating pattern. It's their signature, and that's how they identify themselves. And each individual also seems to have its own sounds that it emits to identify itself. Um, in other words, they seem to have a name for themselves, a self-identifying sound. And that's known from other species of cetaceans, smaller dolphins, and so it's not that inconceivable. Um, I had a thought that just escaped me. Um, but here's another, here's another video clip, some more whales. Cool. So I remembered what my, my thought. So this family always had that sound, click, 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 click. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna try my alien communication thing. So I dive down, I have my housing, and it's uh, you know hollow, or it's got a camera, but it's got an air in there. So, and I go to my housing and I bang out that pattern, click, 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 over and over, just like they're doing. And you know what? They totally ignored me. So obviously they can tell the difference. Um, now, those sounds and th th those video clips are of the female dominated family groups. Every once in a while you get the big males that come back in. I've seen several of these big males. They are big, they are scary. No matter how much you know up here that it's probably okay, they're scary. Here is a photo where you know there's a perspective difference, but that's a 12 meter animal that's about 20 meters, somewhere approaching 20 meters, which is 67 feet or something, something like that, 65 to 75, 70 feet, okay? That means that mouth is four to five meters long, so big, very big, and more than that is the heft and the girth on that thing. Um, it's very difficult to convey that, but when you're next to it, it's just humongous, very scary. There, um, in March, I was with, in with another one. There was a couple friends with me, and we got in with the females first several times. We, I did not, normally I will know when there's a male in the area because they announce themselves, and I'll let you listen to that in a second, but I did not know that there was a male in the area. And we got in one time, and the male passed first, and then a whole bunch of females passed, and we came up, and my friend came up next to me, and she said, did you see that whale? There were so many babies with it. And I turned to her and said, that wasn't a baby, that was a big boy. And she couldn't believe me. I mean, there's, that's how big the difference is. So the way that you know that a male is in the area, you know, we have hydrophones in the water often and we're listening to, you, you listen for the whales more than you look for them. They make very distinctive sounds, something like this. <laughs> very different from the females. So where the females would, would be repeating their codas and making all sorts of buzzing sounds, this one is basically making one or two clicks, very loud, and that's it. No one is sure why, again, I think that if you remember the mechanism, for how they probably make these sounds. There is a sound made at the front of the head by the monkey lips. And I think that the reason this part exists here is as an echo. And if you take any sound and you can measure the time that it goes from origin to a point to another point, you can actually figure out size. 
So instead of necessarily using visual cues for how big and tough and, you know, how macho I am, use the audio cue, I think. I don't know, but I, I know that, you know, when I've heard other males that are smaller, it, sli it sounds slightly less impressive. This one was really, really impressive. Even from a distance, I could hear it. Um, so, I had the good fortune, after seeing all this stuff, of seeing a sperm whale eat giant squid and get photos of it. Now, it's nothing like what you might imagine in all the story books and, you know, the covers of books with the writhing tentacles and the big eyed giant squid fighting and in the life of Pi, if you saw that, the squids actually won, which is inconceivable. But here's what we saw. Um, so that's the giant squid. So what happened was I went back to these islands in, in, in um, Japan and this is a place that's known for giant squid because the fishermen pull them up every once in a while, or bits and pieces of them every once in a while. And you see some bits and pieces floating around every once in a while. So we went out there, and of course I wanted to see this happen. I didn't think I would actually see it happen. But I, we uh, were going along one day, and we saw thousands of birds dive bombing the ocean. Jumped in, and basically they were millions of squid bits everywhere. And we couldn't figure out what was going on. It was kind of dangerous to be in the water because the birds were dive bombing in to get food and they weren't really looking. Um, so we got back out and just as we were getting out, um, the lookout saw whales surface some distance away. So we brought everybody in and headed straight for there. As soon as I jumped in, I saw this and mind clicked and I understood what had happened. They brought up some giant squid, played with it, sh shredded it, and they were still working on it. Now, that's already very interesting. But you remember the mark that I pointed to with the video. And take a look at this whale. You see the mark? That is the same whale. So what happened was that we had followed these whales for three or four days, and the, this specific whale came to check us out. You saw that in the video. That happened many times. You saw in the photo, it was always coming toward us. There were actually eight or nine adults in this group, but it was always this one that came to us. Now, I didn't realize at the time, it was only after I looked through all the photos and matched them all up that I worked this out. So what I think, trying to reconstruct what happened was, we had spent a lot of time with this one family, repeat encounters. This adult female, the matriarch, came to check us out over and over and over. For whatever reason, she felt we were okay. So when she saw us get back into the water with the giant squid, she brought the giant squid to us. Passed directly underneath, very nice, casual pace, no rush, no nothing as if to say, you know, look what I have. And let us take photos and video. That was the first time it's ever been done. Now, why did they bring the giant squid up to the surface? I mean, it, it's not like you see this all the time. Uh, I've consulted many uh, squid experts and whale experts, and we all seem to think the same thing. See, that's a calf. That calf was not diving deep because I saw it many times um, and swam with it many times while the adults were gone. So we think that that calf was of exactly the right age to be weaned and they had actually brought this up and they were teaching it to develop a taste for <coughs> giant squid. Um, that might be the case, it might have given the circumstances. Um, to give you an idea of what the giant squid is like, that is another arm that I picked up. We saw a, um, a sperm whale breach and we're headed in that direction. The lookout shouted that they saw something and I just grabbed my mask and jumped in to um, uh, ask me other questions offline or, or online actually or follow any of the things that I do. That's my contact information. I usually publish uh, or put up stories to that site. I am headed from here to 
the Arctic to try my hand at photographing beluga whales, and then I'll be down in the South Pacific with humpback whales, which will take me through the middle of October. So I'd like to thank the Nantucket Historical Association. Thank you, Marjan, and thanks everybody for coming tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Tony Wu. I know that we have lots of questions, so if you do have one, please feel free to raise your hand and then speak right up. Did you ever encounter um, an aggressive whale, a whale that was aggressive to you? No. Very easy answer, no. Good question, yes. Coming right over to you, Paula. I think connection, I know they don't, they're not built the same and they don't behave the same, but dolphins and whales. I mean, you're talking about non-aggression and smart and organization? Um, yeah, I mean, dolphins are basically small whales, essentially. And these, the sperm whales are, uh, I don't think I talked about this, sperm whales are toothed whales, I mean, obviously from the teeth. Dolphins are toothed whales of the odontocetes, and the others, like the humpbacks and the others, are, are the ones that use um, filters to catch krill. So the very complicated uh, societies and the intricate behaviors seem to be because they use this to hunt food. You know, like um, if you have a pack of wolves on land, they need to coordinate, they work together to grab food. Dolphins do that in the water. Um, they herd things, they, they work together. I believe that these guys do too. Uh, nobody's been down there to watch them doing it, but I've seen from the surface, they go down in a coordinated time, in a coordinated pattern, and they all go down together, they all come up together, and it seems like they're working a grid. I, now, whether they, you know, they come across one squid and one just takes it and eats it itself, or they share, I, I don't know, but it seems as if they are moving in a pattern together with a front and covering an area. So I, I think it's essentially the same, just on a different scale. I see a question here. Let's go. How, how long does the whale live? That's a very good question, and I don't know the answer. But I think they live for um, you know, something like the human lifespan, sperm whales in particular, 60, 70, something like that, years. Good question. We'll find out. How many different whale species have you encountered? How many different whale species have you encountered, Tony? Let's see. Humpback, sperm whales, Brutus whales, blue whales, gray whales, beluga whales, minke whales. I haven't seen a say. That might be it for the big ones. Yeah, lots of dolphins, I think, too. So those count. And some of the beak. Beaked whales, oh no, beaked whales. Two or three species of beaked whales, are, which are ones that live down deep and very rarely make appearance up top. We don't know very much about them. So maybe about 10 total. Yes. Do you ever go in the water with a um, scuba tank and go down deep, deep, or do you strictly swim with um, snorkels? Um, well, and why? Sure. Um, I do other things besides whales, and I do take photos of other things. So yes, I do scuba, but with the whales, um, it is all just swimming um, <clears throat> for a couple reasons. One is, you know, the sound of, when you are in scuba underwater, you s just sound awful. You create a huge racket. That might or might not affect them. I think that um, I, my gut says that if you develop a relationship with a whale first and then do it, it, it might be okay if you just show up and there's this big contraption making all these sonic booms in the water. They probably, you know, they have better things to do. But, and also, more importantly, they move. You saw how they were moving, right? Um, when I'm taking photos of them, I go into the middle of them and move with them. And you can't do that with scuba, or not, certainly not as, as agile, you know. I mean, we're, we'll never be as agile as they are, but you can do things in the water, I mannequin loop and do silly things in the water with them. Sometimes it works, you know, especially with the young ones. If you go in the water and you swim down and you act silly, they look at you, it's like, huh, what's this? And they come over and take a look. 
Another question? Um, I, I don't think so. I think they were they were certainly concentrating on the the baby, you know. But I, I do think that you know they could have gone any direction, any direction at all. They came directly toward us and dived directly underneath us at very relaxed pace. And I just think that they they certainly knew who we were. They come across us before, so there was no problem for them. Another question here, Tony. Just wondered how long can you stay underwater before you need to come up? Um, I'm going to say really long, just so it sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it depends. I mean, if there's nothing in the water and I just go in, it's really not very long. If there's a whale there, I sort of lose track of what's going on. It's probably a couple minutes or so. We have some questions over there. Chelsea, if you want to. How old were you when you started your this career? Hmm. Um, the first time I got in with a whale, with that sperm whale, I would have been uh, 32 or something like that. Um, but starting with underwater stuff, in general, uh, underwater photography and toting around cameras and stuff, probably about 20. 25-ish, thereabouts. Linda, you seem to have a question. How many sperm whales do you think there are in the world today? Well, I lost count after 100,000. <laughs> I've read a lot of estimates, scientists, you know, no one seems to really know but all of them seem to agree there's several hundred thousand. Now, you know, whether that means 100,000, 200,000, 300,000, don't know, but it seems like everybody from all sides of this discussion agree on that, that there are quite a few, because they are circumglobal. I mean, the, every ocean, as far north, as far south, east, west, anywhere you go, there are sperm whales. So it seems like there are a lot. One last question, and then we'll move to the uh, candle factory. Have you seen a uh, whale birth in your um, I have not. And I have a friend who um, was not, is not a photographer, is not a videographer or anything. He just happened across one in the Caribbean, a, a group of them. And he jumped in with a little tiny camcorder thing, and he filmed the birth of a sperm whale, a baby sperm whale. And I saw the footage, it's pretty amazing because this type of social activity is going on and then um, there's the moment of birth and there's afterbirth and the blood and the water and stuff and th this crinkly little baby comes out, it's all folded up. But within a few minutes, it's jumping around and like greeting everybody and all the big adult whales come in to greet the baby. It's this big ceremony thing going on and he was very scared, as, as I would have been, uh, because it's a very um, sort of vulnerable moment. But they actually seemed to push the baby to him. And he was put right with the baby and surrounded, completely surrounded by the whales. And they didn't do anything to him. Um, he's, he has all that on home video. Wow. Yeah. Quick, quick follow-up. Would the marks you identify the whales with, would they be birth marks? I, th I think they, yeah, I, th I think they are. I mean, I can't prove that, but um, I've seen enough to know that, you know, you look here and they're all different. And, but I haven't, say, like, tracked one for its entire life, so I don't know if they change over time. But given the other species of whales I've been with, it's, it, it seems that way. But certainly over a short period of time, if you're with them and you're trying to figure out what they're doing, it's a very convenient and easy way to figure out who's who. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to join me one last time in thanking Tony Roo.